We are just a few days away from the global release of Kogia's Lost Stories, an idea that I thought would never happen. If you're someone who's looking for a beginner's guide to the game, well, you're in luck because I've compiled my over a year experience playing the Japanese version to create this comprehensive guide that goes through every single aspect of the game that will turn you from a complete novice to an expert. It doesn't matter if you are playing the Japanese version or if you are playing the global release version because this guide will apply to you. When the two versions are different, I point them out in the guide. Now I'm going to assume you've never played a gacha game before, so I'll go through all those details and how it affects the game itself. This video is going to be an overview of every single aspect of the game, and I recommend that you go through each section on some level because the information in the guide is built upon the previous sections that I will reference as I go through how this game works. And don't worry, I will have timestamps in the video so you can jump around the different points that interest you the most. Not all tasks have been cleared. Let's start this beginner's guide by going over the gameplay behind Kogias Lost Stories. Let's get to it. So the first question to answer here is, WTF is Kogias Lost Stories? Well, Kogias Lost Stories is a tower defense game, but instead of defending a traditional tower, you're defending these blue spots right here. And since I just talked about these blue spots, let's go through the entire screen here and explain how all this stuff works. So this is a meter right here, which tells you zero to six. The six is how many nightmare frames can reach your blue spots before you lose. Because the whole point of the game is to prevent nightmare frames from reaching your blue spots. So if this mirror goes to six, then you lose. Now, if you get one or two in there, you don't lose the game, but you won't get the best possible score, which we'll go over later. Next we have is this red meter. The red meter tells you exactly how many enemies will be in this current map and how many are still left. So it currently says zero through 68. That's because we haven't destroyed any yet. But as you destroy nightmare frames or airships, it'll continually increment. It's a good way to track how many enemies are still left to destroy before you complete the mission. The mission Next we have is the boss meter. So of the 68 enemies you'll be facing, two of them will be bosses in this map because there's two there. Now bosses are basically stronger versions of the normal nightmare frames or airships. And how you know it's a boss is if you see a character associated with a given enemy. Now usually it's a main character or a side character. Sometimes they use an actual image of a normal pilot instead of like a main character or side character. But generally it's a main character or side character. And the main character or side character will be using their signature nightmare frame. So like Zack and Lancelot, Colin and the Gurren, Lelouch and the Borai, Cornelia and the Gloucester. You get the picture. Now there are two types of interaction with the bosses. The first one is the boss will attack your nightmare frame as if it was a normal enemy. And the second is when you go into like the boss mode where it's a cutscene where you see the two pilots and you have a little introduction, they talk to each other, then it's a one-on-one -on -one battle where your pilot skills are all you have to defeat the enemy boss, which can be annoying at times because you can't use healers or other supportive units. So in case like that, it's good to know ahead of time when you have to face those problems. But anyways, just for this particular situation, Waze just tells you how many bosses will be in this current map. All right, next we have is the speed controls. We have half, default, which is one time, and two X. You need this to control the pace of the battlefield. Sometimes things are going kind of slow, so you want to go really fast. Sometimes you need precise timing to place your pilots. So in that case, you want to go half speed. And one speed is generally like you just want the game to play kind of casually and you're in a good spot. Generally speaking, I do half or two X, Next we have is the routes. So let me unpause here, hit the routes. This tells you where the enemies are gonna come from. Now, I don't have purple here, but we'll go through all the colors anyways. Yellow are airships like helicopters, planes, red are nightmare frames, and purple are bosses. Now you see the routes, they go in a certain direction. That's important because it tells you not only where the enemies are coming from, which is kind of obvious, which is the red spots, but it tells you how they're going to approach your nightmare frames, which is how you can then place yours to defend against it. Now, just as an FYI, not every single Nightmare Frame will follow a given path. Some will do their own things, which is one of the ways the game tries to challenge you. But generally speaking, these routes tell you exactly what to expect the enemies to follow when fighting you. Another thing to note as well, when you've destroyed enough enemy Nightmare Frames, you'll notice these routes will start to go away. That means you will not see any more enemies from that section for the rest of the battle. And that's very important 
because it means you don't have to worry about it anymore. You can move the Night Airframe Pilot away from that section and put it somewhere else if you have to support a different area. So the routes are important because one, it tells you where enemies are coming from, which can help you prepare for the battle. And two, as you're playing through the battle, as routes go away, it means the enemies are no longer coming from that spot. Okay, then we have the pause button. It pauses, that's about it. Then we have the wheel. This wheel here brings up this menu with a bunch of information. I'll go through what it is. So this tells you the name of the mission. This tells you my current clear rank. This tells you the battle score you need to defeat it. We'll get to that later on. This tells you how many enemies you gotta face. This tells you how many can reach your spots before you lose. This is how many you can place, it says eight. Here's the objectives you need to complete it. Complete it. Usually the objectives are things like, make sure no enemies reach your blue spots. Make sure your diaphragm pilots aren't destroyed. Make sure you don't withdraw too many times. It's very simple things like that. And then here we have adjustments to the nightmare frame combat itself. When basically when you deploy nightmare frame or use a special attack, there's a unique animation that goes along with it. And sometimes that can be kind of costly in terms of maybe your performance on the machine, but also like the game itself, because these are natural interruptions that can ruin the pace of play. So you could turn them off to improve that. Now, if it's like an easier battle, you don't really care, but for the harder missions, it's actually better to not have them, but obviously it's up to you. So that's how that works. Then we have this button here, here, which controls the camera. Now this is only in the Japanese version, not in the global, unfortunately. Maybe look at that during the first year anniversary update or whenever they added this, to be honest. Now, how this works is you can zoom in and out of the battlefield, as you see here. This is the current look for the global version right now. Let's go over how this is annoying. You see how the meters are covering the enemy spawn location? or how the pilots down here are also covering a spawn location. Well, yeah, it's it's hard to see what's going on. Going now, it swarms of enemies going across the battlefield and you have like these things blocking. It's extremely annoying. So they add this feature where you can zoom out and now you can see the whole battlefield and you're no longer covering it with this information here. I do not know why this wasn't a default early on, but at least in the Japanese version, they fixed it. So that's how that works. That's the camera. Now back to the menu. There is one additional button that's exclusive to the Japanese version, and that's the restart button. So hit this button here, it'll restart the map. So to give some context, in the global version, and what was originally in the Japanese version, there was only one button here. If you hit that button, it would exit the map and go back to the menu where you had to select a mission. So let's say hypothetically you had the perfect team, but you screwed up in the last minute or something went wrong, you would have had to exit the mission, reselect the mission, reselect the team and then start that's a pain in the ass so this button here simply restarts the mission with your current team in the current map it saves you a lot of time so if i was to hit the button right now i'll hit it right there and it's going to restart the mission and there you go we now restart it so that's how that works we'll get to the camera in a second because i need to first go over this the camera requires obviously nightmare frames to be deployed and there are no deployed nightmare frames now let's talk about the information down here this tells you how many Nightmare Frame pilots you can deploy. It currently says eight because that's the limit. As you deploy more Nightmare Frames, the number will keep going down until it gets to zero. It gets to zero, it means you can't place anymore. The global cost, this is very important. So to place Nightmare Frames, you have to pay a certain cost, the global cost. If you wanna know how much you have, you simply look at this meter right here and it tells you we have 15. Every pilot has a certain cost to deploy. The cost is determined by adding the pilot's cost and the Nightmare Frames cost together which you can determine when putting together your team, and we'll get to that later. But for now, the cost says 15. Any nightmare frame below 15 can be placed. But once you do, obviously that number will be subtracted from your global cost. Now, costs increase through two methods, either through passively waiting, so every second you get one, or nightmare frames that increase it as well. So for example, if I was to select Jeremiah, I could deploy him, and I went down by three, but he increased the global cost by 25. So obviously, you know, that was a big increase right there. So that's how that works. Let me go and just withdraw him right there. Okay, now while in pause, and not necessarily in pause, but I prefer pause, you can view every pilot on your team, including their stats, their base range for the nightmare frame, their skill range, their abilities, etc. That's how that works. And you can view all of them at any time you want, which is great. Now, one key thing to note here as I go through this is the skill and the base range. The reason why this is important is because if you want to effectively use your pilots, you gotta make sure that the direction that they face when deployed would make sense for their abilities and their range as well. You probably know at this point that everything's kinda like a grid, 
which makes sense because that's how the game is stylized. You put an iframe down and it goes in a certain location. And it makes sense thematically as well because one of the themes of Code Geass is the chess elements. So now let's talk about actually deploying a pilot. Let's do it step by step. So first, we're going to unpause, select a Nightmare Frame pilot that you want. We'll go with Colin here. You select and then you push, put it down in a certain location. Now when you do this, there's two options here. You have an option to lock her in place like this. Or if you're not happy with her current location, you can always hit this button right here and it will reset her. So in this case, I wouldn't be canceling it out, but sometimes you might place a pilot in the wrong location. So it helps to have this option available. So I'm gonna go place the pilot down. Now, when you get to this point here, when you are deciding which direction you wanna place the pilot, you can no longer cancel it. This is, you're now officially committed to it. So once you get to this point, it's over. The reason why this location, as you see here, matters is because it tells you which direction you will be fighting. Now, let's say I put Colin looking like this, right? And enemies were to come by the side. She will still fight them off, but she wouldn't use a special if your Nightmare Frame skill special range didn't go in that location. Now, Colin happens to have one that does, but not all do. So for example, let me go and withdraw her. Asahina does not have that because he's using the Gloucester. So I'm gonna place him on the battlefield instead, go in this direction on purpose, of course. All right, by the way, if you noticed a airship just went to one of my sections and the number went up by one. So keep that in mind. Again, the game isn't over now, but I can't get the best score possible. Now, when it comes to Asahina, you see how his is a three-way lance. Well, if the enemy comes from the side, he won't be able to fight them in terms of using a special. You can still defend yourself, but you can't use your special in that location. That's why it's again important to keep in mind where enemies are coming from because then you can place your Nightmare Frame pilots accordingly to intercept them, including the specialists. So just keep that in mind as you are placing Nightmare Frame pilots. Okay, now I wanna talk about the cooldown time or the relocation time. So if you remember, we withdrew Colin earlier in the battle and you see there's a number right by her name, this 26, 26. That's how many seconds have to go by before you can redeploy her to the battlefield. Now hers is actually pretty fast, but some pilots have really slow ones, like 45 seconds, which you might not think is too much, but since these games go between two to five minutes, not having a key pilot for almost a minute can be a huge deal. So it's very important you get the placement correct, because if you don't, you might be waiting a long time to redeploy the pilot. Now, the next thing to talk about is the two different types of Nightmare Frame weapons. You have ranged weapons and you have melee weapons. And the difference is where you can place a Nightmare Frame with either kind of weapon. So for example, Suzaku Kudurugi is using the Lancelot with the Varus Cannon. If I wanted to deploy him, let's say I do that here, notice how the only spots I can pick are these elevated blue zones, that's it. I can't pick the, the ground area where Asahina is, because he's using a ranged weapon and it has to be on a higher elevation like these blocks. blocks. So to deploy him, I would just put him in a certain location like this and bam, there he is. Now he'll attack the enemies because I don't want any more helicopters going to my blue zones. Now for the melee ones, as you saw before, if I was to select, let's say Colin, again, she can only go on these ground areas because she has a nightmare frame with a melee weapon. So there are two types of nightmare frames. So we mentioned the two weapons, of course, melee weapons and ranged weapons. Then you also have the two types, which can be float unit and ground. Float unit nightmare frames, well, they have the float unit and they have two additional abilities because of the float unit. The first ability is that they can be placed on a empty spot on the battlefield. And the other ability is they can change their location throughout the battle. So let's see it in action. All right, so C2 is using the Gwen, and I'm gonna place her on the battlefield on this empty spot here. Actually, we'll go here and I'll explain why. So I'll place her like this and now she is on the battlefield. Now just keep in mind, just because she has a float unit, because it's still a melee weapon, you still have to play her on one of the ground spots. You can't place her on a higher elevation. Now let's do the same thing with Benia, who's in a Starlin Cavalry. I'll place her on this empty spot right here, and there she goes. So Benio is in an air cavalry and she's on one of the empty spots. C2 is on a normal spot, but she's in the Gwen and we're gonna switch her as we progress to the battle. By the way, Jeremiah's relocation time just went to zero so I can redeploy him. Let's do that. Gain my cost and I'm going to withdraw him. To withdraw a pilot, you simply hit this blue button here. Be careful not to hit that accidentally when you wanna hit the skill button. It happens to me all the time, unfortunately. They are right next to each other, which can be annoying. Anyway, so I'm gonna unpause and then withdraw. Now, if I want to change Benio's location, I can simply select her and then see this cost here, seven, and I can move her around wherever I want. 
This is very helpful because sometimes you accidentally misplace a nightmare frame or conversely, you want the pilot to cover multiple areas because Benio happens to be a healer. That's another thing to keep in mind as well. Because Benio is a healer nightmare frame, you'll notice that her range is green. They do that to differentiate between a nightmare frame pilot that's gonna attack on the battlefield or heal on the battlefield. See how it shows green as opposed to red? That's the reason why. Now let's go to the camera function here. There's different options here. You can unpause, you can speed up, go back to normal. You can switch the angles of battle like this, which is kind of cool. And then here you can play it as they're going. You can, I believe you can remove it if you don't care, if you just want like a little pause, stuff like this. And then also you can zoom in on pilots. So see here I'm on Asahina. But it was actually kind of cool little thing here. You can see like the red from the interaction between the night police and Asahina. So I'm just gonna hit forward button here. Now one problem you might have noticed is that See how there's these Nightmare Frame skills indicators by my pilots? But if I go into camera mode, they go away. You can't use them while in camera mode. So while I do love the feature, it's kind of annoying they did that. Now, a pilot is about to reach my spot. So I'm going to hit, I'm going to select Suzaku here and use his Nightmare Frame skill. And there you go. I just used it on him. There will generally be an animation, but I've removed it for the sake of this tutorial, but you will see it on yours because I think by default it has it on, which makes sense. It is one of the draws of the game and the animation is pretty good for a free to play mobile game. Now, in terms of enemies you'll be facing on the battlefield, you've already seen a bunch, but just to go through it, you're gonna face against mass produced nightmare frames. So you have the glass skulls, you see the night police, Sarlins, Gloucesters, Gunryus, Panzer Hummels, things like that. They're all ground at this point, although you may face fly enabled versions down the road when we get to that in R2. Additionally, Nightmare Frames may have other buffs on them that could be annoying. For example, you have exploding Nightmare Frames, which is exactly what it sounds like. If they get destroyed, they explode. Little pro tip, and if you stun them, they will not explode. Then you have cloaking Nightmare Frames. So the Nightmare Frame will actually appear in the battlefield cloaked. And it's annoying because you can't use a ranged weapon against them. The only way to decloak a cloaked Nightmare Frame is you either have to use a pilot with a special ability that can do that, or the Nightmare Frame pilot has to interact with one of your melee weapons. And by doing so, it'll be decloaked. But if you're facing like 20 in a row or 10 in a row, that can still be very cumbersome. So they are annoying at times. Then you have enemy nightmare frames that will go in the different direction than the route initially showed like I mentioned before. And last, you have ones that are invisible. They go right through your nightmare frames. They can't be blocked, essentially. So you could throw a bunch of nightmare frames at it, but just keep in mind that they can't be blocked, which is really annoying. So speaking of block, every pilot has a certain amount of block associated with them. It's usually based on their own skills and the nightmare frame. And that just means how many nightmare frames you can block at one time before they start going past you. If I go to Zaku here, see this pilot over here? It actually got past Asahina because Asahina was already busy with a nightmare frame, as you see right Right there. In fact, let me go into camera mode real quick. So Asahina was busy with the night police, which is why the Gloucester here got past him because he only had a one block. So that's something to keep in mind as well. Know how many nightmare frames your nightmare frame pilot can block, which is important because you might have to back him up with other nightmare frames, like I have Suzaku backing up Asahina. So in addition to deploying nightmare frame pilots, you can also deploy additional items like this. These are mines, there's Gephion Disturbers, and a cube you get through using C2, or the Chinese version of C2, or in certain missions she was associated with in the Lost Zero arc. Those are other things as well you can deploy to help you out during the battle. Now also, if you notice, you have pad pilots listed here and the ones to the right. The ones on the left are ones you've deployed, the ones on the right are Nightmare Frame pilots you have not deployed. Also keep in mind the meter went to four, so keep track of that as you're playing through. You can switch, by the way, between items and units by hitting this button here. So I'm gonna play through a little bit of this just to show you like how it works essentially the gameplay in a nutshell. In a nutshell. As we're going through this, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so C2 right now for her base range is pointing in the wrong direction. I'm gonna simply grab her and, and place her this direction. The reason why that's important is because since she is a Lance Nightmare frame, she can attack enemies two spots ahead. But when she was in the other direction, she, she can only attack in defense. Now she can aggressively go after Nightmare frame pilots that are over here. By the way, sometimes you'll notice that enemy nightmare frames have like these weird effects on them. Those effects can be used against your own pilots. So 
so be aware of that sometimes it decreases your health passively sometimes it will stun you like the sarlins which are really annoying it's one of those things you're gonna have to play through different maps to see how the enemies work and the same goes with bosses on the harder levels will have passive effects to your team which really suck for example they might stun all your units every couple seconds they might passively decrease your health every couple seconds they might increase the speed of the nightmare frames on their side they might cloak the nightmare frames on their side and so forth. So there are pilots that have long range weapons like the Glousers with their guns. Notice I was attacking Asahina over here and because Asahina can't defend himself, he's basically at the Nightmare Frame's mercy. The way you avoid this problem is either cloaking your units or having a Nightmare Frame of your own to intercept it. Well, you see how crazy it's getting and of course you see that they're all following the right routes. Okay, so here's the boss. See how it interrupted the whole battlefield? It appears in their little gun room and there you go now one thing you might have missed there was a little arrow at the top that's what i wanted to bring attention to which i didn't which was stupid but there's a little arrow that appears in the japanese versions for that lets you skip the nightmare frame boss animation the reason why it's important is because as you see here things are getting kind of crazy well let's say you want to place a certain pilot at a certain time so if you're like really into the combat you don't want it to be broken up or interrupted and the boss animations do that so unfortunately with the global version you have to go through it with the japanese you can at least skip it me personally it's still really obnoxious even with those buttons but at least they try to alleviate the annoyance of it <laughs> And this is basically the heart of the combat in a nutshell. This is all it really is. You're just placing Nightmare Frame pilots in a certain location. You're waiting for the enemies to come and attack you because you have to, because obviously it's a tower defense game. And yeah, this this is the um, extent to how it works. It's pretty crazy. It can be a lot of fun times because there's certain situations where placements uh, can be really rewarding. In this case, not so much because this map is kind of simplistic, but in other cases, it's pretty awesome. Let's move on now to the main menu to show you how that works. So I'm going to go to the main wheel. And I'm going to exit the game. So this is the main menu of the game. And I'm going to go through certain parts of it right now. And we'll come back to other parts later on. Just so I can properly show you how everything works. The very first thing you're going to notice. Besides the fact that Colin is so adorable in this outfit. Is that you have your little rank here. This tells you your current rank. If you click on it. It'll bring up your profile. The profile has information like your username. The gender of the character which you can change. Information about how many pilots you have. How many S rank clears you have. Your current rank in arena mode. Things of that nature. The new part for the Japanese. Japanese version it will not be in the global are these plaques plaques you get awarded for doing different missions you actually can sort based on I guess what they're related to and there's also ones for like expedition mode mission completions and things like that these are like a way to keep you I guess motivated to play because they show you hey you did this thing so many times so here you go me personally I don't care I'm just waiting for the Cecile one which has not been out yet but yeah that's your profile in a nutshell let's go back out now I want to discuss a couple other things related to the rank so first of all if it reaches let's say you go to the next level it'll take the stamina that you get for that rank and add it to your current total so I think I have 123 I think it's like 125 if you go to 56 so I would get an additional 123 on top of what I already have which is pretty good now if you want to lock the rooms in the training mode or additional spots on your team you have to have a higher rank I believe it for the team it's like 3 6 8 12 and then 21 and then for a training room I think it's you get one to start then I think it's like 21 and 50 I believe I could be wrong on that but you have to get a high enough rank to get access to all those things which I think is fine and speaking of unlocking stuff to unlock the lights item mode and I believe training you have to complete a certain mission to get them which we will get to later these are the three most important things in the game first is the stamina the stamina determines how many missions you can play a day because every time you play a mission it costs well stamina that's how gacha games work in general if you're not familiar to keep you playing every single day they limit how much you can play per day so they stunt your progress on purpose because they want to incentivize you to either pay them money to keep playing more and more or to use your own items to keep playing more and more more and more and also because this is a mobile game there isn't a whole lot to do if you could play it no limitations that's probably another reason as well it adds like an unnecessary length to the game now in my case my stamina meter is almost filled up but i can add theoretically two different items well three technically to increase it this will increase it by 50 this is by 100 you can overload your stamina but not if it's currently filled up so right now if i used it it would work but if it was 123 it would not work every six minutes it will increase by one point which is not that great next we 
we have is the Sakuradite. You need this to either buy something from the store or to summon characters. That's basically it. Now you can of course buy some as you see here, but I don't generally do that, or you can buy a pass. I just collect it for free, but keep in mind that things are kind of expensive, so it's up to you if you're playing for free to budget yourself correctly. Then we have the Black Knight coins or gold, whatever. This is important for building nightmare frames, for upgrading pilots, and upgrading nightmare frames. Very important. Not hard to acquire, but you need a lot to do things in the game, so keep that in mind. Now that you understand how these three mechanics work, let's go into the scout functionality, which is where you will do your summoning. Now a gacha game is basically like a slot machine, but instead of matching real sets, you're trying to get certain pilots. You'll see a bunch of common stuff you don't want, you know, the average pilots are easy to get, but the ones you want are the ring threes and fours, for which are harder to acquire. The idea is you, you keep summoning like you pull the lever, so you get what you want. That's how it works, it's very addicting. You're like, oh, I got, I almost got the character. So you just keep, you keep pulling the lever until you get the character you want. It's the same mechanic. You don't know what you're gonna get, and so that's how they keep you hooked. By the way, anytime Time you want you can hit this button right here whatever menu you're in and it'll give you information on how stuff works sometimes it gives you like nice little graphic stuff and other times it just gives you text you can look at now there are many different types of banners in the game the first one we're going to talk about is the event banner like this one this new rollo there also could be a banner for maybe a halloween event or summer or a new chapter came out the reason why you would go after these banners is because the pull rates are generally better hit this button here and it will show you the general pull rates so you see here that if you summon one to get a rank three, you have a 15% chance. But if you do 10, you got a 97% chance. Rank fours don't change. But for the pilot themselves, you see how it's like a 0.99%. That's actually really good because look at the ones that are below it that are rank fours. It's like 0 0.04, which is god awful. So if you want a certain pilot, your best chance is to get them from their specific banner. Although I will say from my experience, I've gotten a lot of rank fours to my free summon of the day, even though the odds were extremely unlikely. So I don't know, that's how it works, I guess. And then this gives you information about the character themselves, their stats, if you want to actually know what they do. So that's that. Now, another type of banner not listed here, a step up banner, which basically allows you to pay Sir Masakurai a little less than normal to get like 10 summons and you keep building up the ladder and eventually you're guaranteed like a free rank four or something. Now, for some reason, in this game you can only use paid sakura die not the ones you acquire for free which is bull crap because even genocide code did not do that crap but there's the step up banners like i said there's reprint banners where they'll take a pilot that's already been well printed and they will reprint it usually it's ones that were done for limited but also can be for unlimited and it's done so you can have an easier chance to get them like i said before if you go to the pull rates of a nightmare frame pilot that's already a part of the banner they're pretty bad so they'll do the reprint banners to increase your odds of getting those pilots occasionally lost stories will also give out a banner where you can spin for free that gives you 10 free characters and these only happen on special events there are also birthday banners that are made in honor of a character's birthday for these particular events they give you 10 free tickets to get at least one attempt at the character before you have to spend your own resources to get them this birthday character is the only rank four character on the banner, making it easier to summon them when compared to other rank fours on other banners. After that, you also have the standard banner. This one's available all year round, and it gives you access to basically every pilot. The pull rates are slightly better, but still not great. One quick pro tip, you get a free summon every day from this, so take advantage of that, it's very important. It will not count to the pity system, but at least you get a free summon. And like I said, I've gotten tons of rank fours from that, so take advantage of it. By the way, since I brought it up, there is a pity system in the game. It's 200 summons, which will cost you 60,000 Sakuradite to do it. I only have 60,000 right here. So that gives you some perspective about how hard that is to do if you're playing for free. And keep in mind, I'm very conservative with how I spend my Sakuradite as well. But you gotta do 200 summons to guarantee the rank for you wanted, which is kind of crap. Next we have is the Rainbow Ticket Banner. So basically through the cost of one Rainbow Ticket, you're guaranteed a rank four from this pool of characters. So you see here, all these characters here, you got like a 2% chance of getting them and see rank 4 is 100% but rainbow tickets are extremely rare I think they're only available early on in the game when you first start and then after that only through the pass I believe which is kind of BS but there you go then you have the black ticket banner which is just like a normal standard banner except you pay for it with black tickets you can do one summon or ten if you look at the pull rates exactly the same as the normal banner so you see here I'm just go to that it says 0.065 and then you go into here and
and it says 0 0.065. Also, no pity system, as if that matters. That's the gotcha mechanic. You'll be doing this a lot because you have to get pilots, of course, to win. But my only rule of advice is if you're playing this game for free and not playing on whaling, be conservative about how you spend your resources because you won't have the security that you need to get the characters you want later on during the game. And key in mind, they're always power prepping. So don't feel like if you haven't gotten a certain pilot, you're screwed. Don't worry, they'll make something better. They always do, which kind of sucks. But they have to do that to keep you invested. During the summoning animation for a character, there are several variations that can occur that determine what you're going to get. So if you have a golden background, you're getting a rank 3 for sure. If you have a silver background, you can still get a rank 3, but not as guaranteed. If you have a purple background, you're getting at least one rank 4, possibly more. If you see Lelouch in the Zero costume, then you're going to get a rank 4. Now, another thing to note is that each of the chess pieces represent the different ranks in the game. So black chess pieces are rank 1, silver chess pieces are rank 2, golden chess pieces are rank 3, and rainbow chess pieces are rank 4. The chess pieces correspond to the type of characters in the game, so you can tell which type of character you're going to get based on the chess piece. Later on in this tutorial, I will go over, over on how all the pilots are organized based on these types and what these types mean. Chess pieces can also get upgraded during this entire sequence, which means you can get a rank 2 becoming a rank 3 or rank 4 character. And what's really cool is sometimes that might even happen if you don't see Lelouch in the Zero costume. It's not common, but it has happened. So now that we've gone over how the gameplay works, how you get pilots and nightmare frames, which I should have mentioned before that on the banner itself, you probably noticed there were certain nightmare frames attached to a pilot. That tells you that if you summon that pilot, you will get that nightmare frame. Just keep that in mind as well. And since we've gone through all those things, let's go through how you actually upgrade a pilot and a nightmare frame. And to do that, we must go into the enhanced sections. So let's do that right now. Before we move on to actually going through the process of upgrading a pilot and upgrading Nightmare Frame, let me just briefly explain how you get both of these in the game. So for the pilots, you can summon them, you can get them as an award, or you can buy them in a store during certain events. Now, if you notice for the global release, they're actually giving away pilots if they reach a certain amount of signups. Now for Nightmare Frame, there's five ways you can get it. You can of course acquire it with a pilot on the banner. During the Nightmare Frame boss battle, if you get a high enough score, you will also be rewarded a Nightmare Frame. During events, just like pilots, you can also purchase Nightmare Frames. And finally, there's a shop that lets you buy Nightmare Frames, but that costs your actual money. Now here we have four things you can do in the menu. You can enhance pilots, nightmare frames, develop nightmare frames, and dismantle nightmare frames. Because there are three sections for the nightmare frames, it's a little more complicated. So let's instead just focus on the pilots. I'll click this button, click this to go into it. So this shows you all the pilots in the game. And what's nice is you can sort by different factors, the rank, the type, and the faction. Currently I have it sorted by the assault type. So I'm going to hit this button here, which resets it. And now bam, here's all the pilots I have organized by level. So what you can do besides sorting it by these three factors, you can also sort pilots based on their level, how expensive they are to place, their health, the rarity, the intimacy level, their melee attack rate, you see here, and then of course you have the range attack rate, you have dexterity, agility, etc, etc. Now the bottom here tells you how many pilots you have total, which is kind of cool. So first, let's talk about the different rankings. So we have rank ones. Rank ones are the easiest to summon. So on the banner, you notice it's like 40 or 50% chance of getting them because they're extremely easy to acquire. Not the strongest in the game, still useful early on. And sometimes you might have to use them if you're desperate for a particular type of pilot. For example, Naomi is still used in many Black Knight teams because she's a healer and there aren't many Black Knight healers in the game. So that is a case where she could still be useful despite being a rank one. Next we have our rank twos, which are slightly better than rank ones. And they are very useful in certain instances. For example, Detard cloaking ability is still one of the best in the game. Rockstar's cost reduction plus attack boost is one of the best in the game. And then you also have characters like Senba, who is a good defensive pilot. Nagisa and Millie are cost reduction slash cost producers. There are pretty good rank twos in the game, but still they're not the best compared to like rank threes and fours. Then we have rank threes, which are they're really powerful, but obviously not the best. <laughs> I'm not. I'm, I'm not sure a better way to describe it. Uh, their rarity is. They're not as easy to acquire as, uh, let's say, rank twos, but they're still not too difficult. 
There aren't too many in the game because unfortunately Lost Source is taking the route that Genesary Code went, which is kind of bullcrap, where they're mass producing tons and tons of rank fours over everything else. Because since rank four pilots are the hardest to acquire, you'll have to spend more money to get them, which is kind of scummy, but apparently that's how the game is played. At least we don't have rank fives yet. Jeez, we, if we ever get that, I don't even know. But anyways, rank threes are not too difficult to get, and I would say for 90% of the game, you can probably beat most levels with them. So they're pretty powerful, and they have really good abilities. I mean, Lelouch is still one of the best in the game. Cecile is not bad. Suzaku is pretty good. So they're not terrible. They do come into play quite often. Oh, Benil is also really powerful. Then we have the rank fours which are the best pilots in the game and are the hardest to acquire, like from the pool rate, which you saw, which was god awful. Yet I have a lot I've been playing for a while, but notice one thing I should mention is that if I go to the level of these pilots right here and I sort it by ascending, most of my rank fours are 70 or lower because I only summoned it once. And we'll get into how that works later on, but you have to summon the pilot several times if you want to fully max them out. In my case, I have mostly 60s because, well, I haven't done that yet. It's hard just to get one of them. Now imagine getting multiples of the same. Yeah, it's not easy. Okay, next, let's talk about the specific types of pilots. So first we have our Annihilators. Annihilators are the strongest attackers in the game, both range attack and melee attack. And one thing I should mention, in many of my videos you've probably watched, I tend to say things like, this pilot has higher range attack over melee attack. And the reason why I say that is because certain Nightmare Frames only have one weapon or the other. And so you generally want to use a Nightmare Frame pilot with high melee attack, with a nightmare frame with a melee weapon, and vice versa. High range attack for a ranged weapon. That's just speaking a good tip for putting a nightmare frame pilot with the right nightmare frame. Sometimes you don't have to do that, but generally speaking, it's a good tip. So Annihilator pilots have the highest attack in the game. They have pretty good health, pretty decent defense all around. They're the strongest attackers. So what's the problem? What's the catch? Well, they also have the highest cost in the game. If I sort by cost, and I go from top to bottom, notice how all the Nihilers have insane high costs, like 22, 19, 17, 16. That's a lot, and keep in mind, the cost to deploy a Nightmare Frame, like I said before, is the pilot cost plus the Nightmare Frame cost, which means that some of these are even more expensive. That's the problem with Annihilators. So you can use them in battle, obviously make a team built around several, but keep in mind that if you only have Annihilators, you're not going to win because you'll have an imbalanced team and ultimately won't be able to deploy all of them to the battlefield and you'll lose because the enemies will either overwhelm the one you placed or they'll just go to your blue zone before you have a chance to place any other Nightmare Frames. So while Annihilators are really powerful, you can't build a team with just Annihilators because you need other pilots, of course, to support them. One of those is, in fact, the Assault, or the Knights. By the way, all the types are based on chess pieces because, again, this is a Code Geass game. Now, Knights or Assault type pilots are categorized with low cost. They tend to have cost increasing abilities and they have pretty good attack and health for their type. Their goal is to give you field presence while also increasing your cost. They're basically your scouts. Notice how, like, they all have this thing called C. That means they increase your cost. A Siva down arrow means it decreases the cost for a particular faction or perhaps itself. So while assault pilots are not the strongest in the game, they're very useful for giving you field present while also increasing your cost. And you want to have several on your team to help generate enough cost to deploy other pilots. Next you have our strategy type pilots. These are ones that are designed to provide benefits when they are deployed on the battlefield. Now if you remember in the beginning I mentioned that when you withdraw a pilot they have a certain cooldown time before before you can redeploy them. Well, strategy type pilots are categorized by having a very fast relocation time. And the purpose behind that is so you can withdraw and then redeploy them throughout the battlefield. They're not really meant to stay in one location at a given time. They're meant to be deployed, then withdrawn, and then move around the battlefield because that's how their abilities tend to work. And while other pilot types do have fast relocation time, it's not common. Like even Nihilators have fast relocation time, such as Cecile or Lelouch. But all strategy pilots tend to have that because again, the purpose is to deploy them, withdraw, and then put them back in the battlefield at different parts to provide benefits. As an example, C2 provides barriers. Lelouch does like 40 damage, increase the attack power of all nightmare frames on the battlefield. Marybell will attack enemies right away. Way, and so does Halloween Jeremiah. The loose stuns, like I mentioned before, 
these two boost speed count a sub healer so things like that they're really powerful pilots and they're good for essentially buffing debuffing enemies and being able to move around the battlefield very quickly next are the defensive pilots defensive pilots are categorized by having high health high defense of course because they're defensive and the most blocks in the game most do not have high attack but there are some that do the general point of a defensive pilot is to be a block or, or a shield to protect your other pilots or just to protect the battlefield itself maybe you have to stall out whatever the case may be that's their initial function like i said their attack power tends to be pretty low although there are some that are pretty high like you see here actually that's the wrong one this one i wanted so like count has 705 the main character has 451 Suzaku has 405 which are pretty good numbers but obviously compared to night layers that's not that great most pilots here if you notice don't have high attack because their focus is defense if i go to like blocks for example the best blockers in the game and if i get rid of uh this filter right here the best blocker in the game are generally defenders c3 three 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 and then you get like look at the rest of them ones or perhaps zeros so defensive pilots are really useful depending on your team i recommend a couple because they do help out and they're good for blocking next we have are the special types special types are nightmare frame pilots they don't really fit in any other category hence why they are special they have usually very interesting combination of abilities for example suzaku here gives himself a barrier he also increases nightmare frame skill gauge on deployment rock shot decreases the cost of black knights while also boosting attack on deployment monica has a cloak and a fast relocation time then you have yuffie millie and nully who have either blow away or pull blow away will send nightmare frames in a different direction and pull will bring them towards you this comes into play if the map has like a whole spot like i showed you before you can push nightmare frames into that spot or you can pull them towards you if you happen to be on that spot so special pilots are pretty useful i don't use them that much because they're very useful for niche situations like some of these are specific towards faction or scenario but they are kind of cool and i like how they have these pilots with unique abilities that don't really fit any other category hence why they are the special type. Next we have our healers. And as her name suggests, well, they're healers. That's what they do. They tend to have either high melee attack or high range attack, which again plays into which nightmare frame they should be in. One thing I'll say about healers, they tend to have really cool effects that either help themselves out or buff your nightmare frames or debuff the enemy or provide really cool just general effects like cost reduction and things like that. Healers are very important in the harder missions. On the easier missions, healers are not as important, so it just depends on what you're doing. There's also a subclass called sub healers which are pilots that are not actually part of the healer class but they also heal so for example c2 is a sub healer but she's annihilator class you see how there's this little like heart with the plus sign that's how i know she's a sub healer same with valetta another example is colin she's a sub healer as well psycho is a sub healer so there are certain cases where you may not even use a healer pilot because you have a sub healer which is better i mean in c2's case I go up to real quick she obviously is a powerful annihilator and happens to heal on the side so she's pretty powerful so those are the different types slash classes in the game now let's move on to factions every pilot is part of several factions which are broken down into the three core ones you have the black knights ashford and britannia then you have sub factions based on those like the knights of the round the jlf the special core the royal family the Peace Mark, Kyoto, the Chinese Federation, the EU, the Glinda Knights, and when we get them, the W0 Squad, or Wyvern Squad, or the Giaz Order, whatever the case may be. And in addition to that, you also have factions based on events, like we have here the Athletic Faction, or the Halloween Faction right here, or perhaps even the New Year's Faction. There are also pilots that are part of the Multi-Tool. Multi-Tool are pilots that are part of multiple factions and they can be used in multiple factions which comes in handy for challenges that require a specific faction but that's essentially how that works now the thing about factions is that they tend to work together which you know kind of makes sense for example in the recent summer event benio has a cost reduction ability for anyone in the faction plus a cost reduction for colin which is another point a lot of pilots will have abilities that are either tailored towards their faction or towards a specific pilot like i said benio has a cost reduction for any pilot named colin you have a suzaku that does any cost reduction for suzaku you have a euphemia that has a cost reduction for any suzaku pilot and you have a colin that does any cost reduction for lelouch oh and there's 
also Kaguya, who also has a cost reduction for Lelouch. So with all that in mind, the idea is you want to use pilots within the same faction because they tend to work together. For example, in the Black Knights, you have a pilot like Asahina, if I can find him, where he boosts the attack power of all Black Knights currently deployed, or you have Lelouch who does the same thing, or you have someone like Nagisa, who boosts the defense of all Black Knight pilots, or Colin, who boosts the speed of all Black Knight pilots, and they all tend to work together. Now, you don't have to use pilots of the same faction to make a great team, but I will tell you, for the harder missions, it makes all the difference in the world if your pilots happen to work together. So a good tip is to just keep in mind which pilots you have of different factions, understand their abilities, and try to put together a team of pilots that would work together naturally. Now, you can also do things like have maybe three or four pilots from a certain faction with other pilots of another faction that's totally fine too now like i said factions is not just for putting together a really good team there are many times in the game where you'll have to use specific factions as part of a challenge so again it's very important to keep in mind how that it works so now that we've discussed how the different pilots are categorized, let's talk about how you actually level them up, right? That's kind of important. I'm going to go to Colin to give you an example. So I'm going to hit rank four, Annihilator, and to go even more specific, because I, I, I want to make this easy as possible, I'll go to the swimsuit faction, and that gives us both C2 and Colin. So let's go to actually C2. That's probably a better example. Okay, so first of all, on the screen, we have a couple pieces of important information. The health, the cost, the block, the melee attack, and the range attack, and other piece of information. Now, the first thing you can do to level up a pilot is to literally level them up using these XP items. You can also level them up through combat and through the training room, which we'll get to later. What's really nice, they put a slider right here. It doesn't work obviously because the character is fully maxed out but the slider is great because you don't have to keep hitting the same button over and over again for some reason janissary code didn't know what that was and when i first started playing this game the slider was a very nice addition which, which i thought would be a natural thing to include but here we are next we have is the awakening so how this works is when you level up a certain pilot they'll have naturally pretty high stats as a result but you can further increase their stats by doing awakenings awakenings are upgrade that cost a certain resource in this case we have silver annihilator pieces which makes sense because it is a annihilator type so you see a queen piece here and a queen symbol here it's a good way to help you keep track of what goes to what we also have some additional items like the black knight helmet and also the black knight pendulum or metal whatever and so to upgrade different pilots you have to essentially pay the cost that requires different items now in the global version this is where it stops you go level 9 and that's it but in the japanese version it goes to 15 and to go to 15, you need a certain item. So you see here we have the chessboard, the Gia symbol here, and the Gia symbol there. And that's what you need as well to upgrade past level 9. Now another thing to notice, you see this little 5 here? That's intimacy. So basically, as you use a pilot throughout the battle, not only will their level increase, if you haven't already maxed it out using, you know, this system here, their intimacy will also increase. And that's important because your pilot must get to intimacy 5 for you to be able to fully max them out. Currently, my pilot is at intimacy 4. And you know this because if your pilot is below a certain intimacy level, anything that's locked out will have a certain cover on it tells you hey you gotta be four or three or whatever when you first get the pilot you can upgrade the first three levels you know awaken them without ever increasing intimacy but beyond that you know four through six i believe has to be i think one to two and then no i'm, I'm wrong i think four to six is intimacy two and then seven to like nine is like three four and five so it's important to make sure you're using the pilot often if you want to fully awaken them then we have limit break limit break is how you get the pilot to go from the max of 60 to say 70 80 or so forth so during the gacha mechanic you're going to summon multiples of the same pilot especially if it's a rank one two or three four is really difficult but when you do you will get a duplicate character locket like what you see here and you use those duplicate character lockets to limit break a pilot now you have to summon the same pilot five times if you want to get to the 99 because the first locket will take them from 60 to 70 the second one goes from 70 to 80 the third one 80 to 90 and you have to get two more rounds to go from 90 to 99 which kind of sucks but again you need to use the character duplicate locket to limit break them you can also use 
generic lockets, which is what this is. You'll notice that you need more generic lockets to equal the quality of a duplicate locket. See how it says 10 here? And this one says 39. I'm sorry, it says 20. So obviously it's more expensive. Now the thing is, some pilots in this game are limited. That means that once the banner ends, you can no longer get that pilot until they do a reprint banner. So in the meantime, like in my case here, I got C2 but only once. So if I wanted to upgrade her, I would have to use generic lockets to do that. And that's why they essentially exist. One, to make it easier to limit break a pilot if you don't have duplicates, but also because certain pilots, if you don't get them, that's it and you're kind of screwed. So it gives you this method to upgrade them. Unfortunately though, obviously getting these lockets it's not the easiest, so it's kind of annoying, but at least they give you the option to do this. Now, additionally, if you hit this button here, you can see more stats of the pilot. You can zoom in on the picture. You can flip them around to see their 3D. I switch your costume, which we'll get to later. You can flip them around. You have the action type for when they're in arena mode. You have their abilities here, their factions and so forth. It gives you all the information about the character. This is how many awakenings I've done. So if I go back to the other screen, see I've done up to four, that's what that means. And that's how you upgrade a pilot. Again, there are three aspects, leveling them up, awakenings, and limit breaks. We'll discuss later on how you acquire items to both awaken and limit break. Now let's talk about the nightmare frames. So let's first go through how the Nightmare Frame upgrade system works. So just like before, you can sort by the factions, but instead of, let's say, the level and things like that, you can instead sort by, we have here, melee weapons, you can sort by range weapons, you can sort by float units, you can sort by ground units, you can do ground units that are ranged weapons, and so forth. So that's how you can sort through the different uh, Nightmare Frames. Now, Nightmare Frames work a little differently. There's no limit break, there's no Awakenings. They're called Remodel instead, see Remodel. But it, it works the same way as Awakenings. You go through different levels, but you don't have, there's no intimacy. So when you get a Nightmare Frame, you can fully upgrade it the moment you get it, as long as you have the resource to do so. So you go to a different weapon. Let's see this melee weapon here, which is the various swords, uh, I'm sorry, the mass vibration swords. And so you can upgrade them using a item that represents the melee Nightmare Frame weapon, which is why you see a sword. There is bronze, silver, and and then of course gold. And just like with the pilots, there's additional things you might need to upgrade them, like these eggs here. They're not actually cold eggs, I call them that. And these nightmare frame cubes and this energy thing here, which I will discuss later on how I got the cubes. Now the thing about nightmare frame weapons is that there's a little catch to them. So you see how this is the bearer's cannon, right? Now the actual attack, if you look down the line, is 325, or in the nightmare frame store, you'll see it's 325. Then how come I only see 305? Well, you have to also upgrade other weapons to increase attack power of this weapon. Another example of this is the Gwaine, where if I can find it, oh, maybe I have, you know, I, I probably have a filter on that preventing me from seeing it. Let's see, yeah, I did ground only, okay. So you go to the Nightmare Frame, the Gwaine, you'll see that the range attack is 300, but it wasn't like that until I upgraded the melee weapon. So a lot of times you have that element where they buffed up some of the Nightmare Frames by adding additional weapons. And some Nightmare Frames in the global version will not have new weapons that the Japanese version does. For for example, the Shen Hu has a new weapon, the Percival has a new weapon, the Tristan has a new weapon, so that's not going to be available in the global version, only in Japanese. Now another thing too about Nightmare Frames is that certain weapons are not unlocked by default as you see here. So you'll have to unlock them using these items and a golden version of whatever type of weapon it is, either melee or range. And since we're here, let's discuss something else. If I hit this button here, I can view more things about the Nightmare Frame. I can see the 3D version, which is kind of cool. I can see the stats, the Nightmare Frame's base range and the skill range. If you want to switch weapons, you have to do it here. Simply select the Nightmare Frame weapon you want, hit this button here, and bam, now you have it. If you go back into the main menu, the Nightmare Frame now shows up like this, as opposed to before, where it showed up like this. That's how you know you switch weapons correctly. So hit so I'm gonna switch it back to the Varus Cannon, but that's how that works. It's kind of annoying you can't do that outside of this menu. So that's essentially how Nightmare Frame upgrades work in general. It's pretty simple compared to the pilots, but there is one complex element to that, which is the Nightmare Frame cubes. Before I discuss that though, there are other Nightmare Frames in the game that don't use the standard items to upgrade them. These are the ones that come from the Nightmare Frame boss event or events like that. So this is the Pluton Sarlin. And if you notice, we see this item over here, which is not a standard upgrade upgrade item. You get this item through the Nightmare Frame boss event or something like that. And the thing is, while it's nice, you don't have to use normal items to upgrade it. If you don't have enough of these, 
you'll never be able to fully upgrade the nightmare frame basically forever so it's important that if you're going to commit to these nightmare frames to fully commit to it otherwise you can't get the full thing for example there were giveaways for these new Gurren Mark II's, and the one I had, this one here, I did not get all the items. So if I scroll all the way down, I believe I'm missing one. I think you need like a hundred, or like, I think you need like a hundred of these. I think I'm missing one. So I couldn't fully upgrade it because of that. Now moving on, let's talk about the Nightmare Frame cubes. So I mentioned before you need them to upgrade a Nightmare Frame. How do you get these cubes? Well, you get them through converting your extra Nightmare Frames. So a little bit of context here. If you summon a pilot that comes with a nightmare frame, you will have immediate access to that nightmare frame. But if you get duplicate nightmare frames, so let's say you summon the same pilot multiple times that comes with a nightmare frame, that nightmare frame will become a duplicate cube. And from that duplicate cube, you can do two things with it. Either convert it into a nightmare frame upgrade cube, which was that blue cube we saw earlier, or you can turn it into a nightmare frame. To turn it into a nightmare frame, you have to use a nightmare frame development section right here. You can build up three at a time, which is cool. You select which one you want, and this tells you how many additional duplicate cubes you have. So we have three here, four, th three, 12, that's a lot, eight, whatever the case may be, and you, sl you select it, and then you can build it. So that's one thing you can do. Again, the other is to turn it into a Nightmare Frame upgrade cube, which we'll get to later. Let's say hypothetically, you just started the game and you need more Nightmare Frame upgrade cubes, but you don't have enough duplicate Nightmare Frame cubes to convert them. Well, you can dismantle Nightmare Frames you currently have if you don't want to use them. Maybe you built one by accident or you realize you don't use one as much as you like, so you don't want it anymore. What you can do is go to the Nightmare Frame dismantle section. You can go to any Nightmare Frame that you've currently built or you got through the gacha mechanic or maybe as an award and you can dismantle it into a Nightmare Frame duplication cube, which you can then use to turn into a Nightmare Frame upgrade cube. You can also actually do this thing where you'll take a Nightmare Frame, dismantle it and then rebuild it to get certain items from the mission awards so that's the basics of how upgrading pilots and upgrading nightmare frames work now let's talk about how these are actually used in the quest modes let's go through that so here is the quest homepage. Now let's go through each of these to explain how this works. So first we have is the main story. And for simplicity's sake, I will go to R1 since that's where you'll be at if you're using the global version versus say the Japanese version. Now there are three sections to this. You have story, battle, and extra. Let's go through these. So first with story, I'll start with the second uh, chapter or second part because the whole thing's a chapter. So wait, that's not true. No, I'm sorry, just the second chapter, the whole thing's like an R1 or something. I always forget how that works. Anyways, for the story portion, you can view any particular phase through it to watch the story. So if I hit this one, it'll load up and you can see just the gameplay itself, which is kind of cool with the three animations, which are really nice. I'm gonna skip it though, because I got other things to talk about, but that's how that works. To go through all the phases, you have to complete all the battles. So what I mean is, let's go through phase two real quick. You see this little key thing here? If you click on it, it tells you, hey, if you complete this, you can view phase 24. If I go back to the story, phase 24 is here. And once you complete that, you can view the rest of it. You have to complete all the battles first before you can view all the story parts, which is fine. Genesis Era Code had them like intertwined, which was really stupid. I like the system a lot more. Now let's go through more information about how this works. When you want to pick a mission, there are key pieces of information you should be aware of. This right here is the stamina cost. This right here is the strength of a team you need to complete it, which I'll explain later on what that means. But essentially, if your team's current battle score is higher or equal to this, you can win. Sometimes it can be less and sometimes it can be more and it's still not good enough. So it just depends on the situation. Here it's about right. You can hit this magnifying glass and it'll tell you information about the battle. So here it says that if 10 enemies reach, you lose. You can only deploy Deploy seven again the battle score 43 enemies here's the enemies you'll be facing if you see a pilot by a nightmare frame that's a boss you're gonna get gold for being this you also get Britannia medals as well this little button here tells you the map itself which is important because you can prepare accordingly you see how we have a lot of ground spots and el high elevation spots which means you can place nightmare frames of different weapon types on that it's very important to do as much research as you can about the battle you're about to partake in before you actually partake in it so you have the right team so after doing that let's say we want to play this battle right so you hit the button 
to go into it. You can select your team. Now there's different teams available to you that you can customize to however you'd like. In fact, let's go through how that works. So to go into team, you want to first hit home, then go into team. Now you can technically do most of this from that other menu we just went through, but there are some things you cannot do, which is why I recommend if you're going to build a team, do it in the team menu, unless of course you want to make some quick changes on the way. So here's a couple things to note. Number one, you can change the name of the team. That's super important because by labeling stuff, it's easier to find the teams you want for certain situations. For example, I have one for arena mode. I have one for the nightmare frame boss battle. I have one for the Royal family fashion challenges for fun. This is leveling up. I have one for the Black Knights. I have one for Britannia, Ashford, and so forth. It's good to have things labeled for ease of access. The reason why I have a level up team is because you increase intimacy while you use certain pilots. Eventually, you're going to be able to simulate battles. And to simulate battles, it's good to have pilots you want to upgrade in the process. So you're getting items from the missions you're completing, but you're also improving the intimacy of a given character. And just another thing to note, if you see this little blue thing that means their intimacy is, is level five if you do not it means it's not level five so that's essentially how that works for the quest like i said before you click the mission you want you pick the team you want then you can hit this arrow again to view more information and then you select the red button and go into it you can simulate this part using a skip ticket skip tickets like do that they're pretty easy to acquire so i'm never going to run out they give you so many in the game i often wonder why they even are a thing but uh there you go because stamina already limits you i'm not sure why you have to use skip tickets but they threw it in there for whatever reason there's there's also skip tickets for training mode, which we'll get to later. So that's how the main normal battles go down. There's also something called the extra battles, which are these. These are harder versions of the missions you completed in the regular battle. So for example, in this one here, the battle strength is 2400. And here, the battle strength for the highest mission was 12,500. So that's a huge difference. By the way, the battle score, I, I forgot to mention, if I was to go back to six here and then click on this. So it says 24,000, which you need to complete it. Your team battle score will be displayed right here. If you ever want to know if it's high enough to complete a mission again like i said before it could be lower and you could still complete it it could be higher and it could still be impossible so the battle score you know take it for what it is i think nine percent of the time it's accurate but when it's not though it's really annoying so now we've gone through the main story let's go through daily quests to get the items you need to upgrade pilots or nightmare frames this is where you go to do that every day you can play these different missions three times a day that's why it shows you three out of three that means i still have three to play and if you want to get certain items for example this is the special and healer items these are annihilators and assault strategy and defense and these are the nightmare frame upgrade items so in this case here you can select this particular mission you want to play before i do that one quick thing if you go to the magnifying glass it tells you which items you're getting so in this case it's the bronze level in this case it's the silver level and in this case it's the gold level well other than that it functions exactly the same way as we discussed before one thing i forgot to mention when putting together a team you have to select the pilot you want and also the nightmare frame now when you select a nightmare frame you will notice that there are certain indicators as to who's using what in the global version this is not currently available but in the japanese it tells you who which pilot is using which nightmare frame which is really helpful because if you notice i have a bunch of lancelots so it's hard to remember which pilot is using which lancelot so here it tells you just one quick tip about building a team so that's basically how the quests work one additional thing to mention is that there's these items that boost how many items you get when you complete these missions if you turn it off it won't be used if you turn it on it will be you get one a day as part of the daily login bonuses and you get more throughout the week if you complete certain challenges just like the main story you can also skip through these missions by simply doing this to skip through them and in cases like this this is why you want to have a level up team because then you can skip through the missions while getting items and increasing the level slash intimacy of whatever pilot you're trying to upgrade then there's another story, which is like the main story, except it's a little more simplistic. By the way, there's something called side story that's not been released yet, so all we have at this point is just character stories. You go into a character you want, pick Lelouch for example, and you have a bunch of missions. You have phases and actual battles. Unlike main story, which broke it into three different sections, here it's all one big section. Which is fine because there's not too many to complete anyways. Other than that, it works exactly the same way. 
Then we have challenge mode. Challenge mode, as its name suggests, are harder missions than, of course, the main story. And what's interesting about challenge is there's four weeks, and each week you have a different challenge. So the Japanese version, the way this works is each week you have a different faction you can only use to complete that challenge. For example, in this week, you have to use, if I'm not mistaken, the royal family. And the way I know this is because if you go through the different teams I have, you can see which ones are not read out. The ones that are read out are the ones you cannot use. So if I select the pilot here to put the team together, you can see pilots that are not available for this particular challenge, which is based on faction. There's also different types of missions. Per the faction wars, you have normal, extra, and special. These are unique changes they add. For example, in this one, there's no cost associated with deploying nightmare frames, which is really interesting. Now in the global version, what you're going to have instead is normal challenges not based on faction that are cycling through the week. And if I remember correctly, the way it works is first week is enemies are cloaked. Second week, it costs nothing to deploy nightmare frames. The third week is you don't generate cost passively. So you have to use a nightmare frame to generate cost. And the fourth week is you can't use your nightmare frame specials, which is kind of difficult. Additionally, in the global version, there are something called faction challenges, which used to be in the Japanese version, which instead of having like what you see here, challenges based on a faction, it'd be its own separate thing with its own separate awards and even pilots that were released for it, like Dalton, for example. So just to recap, the global version will have challenges that are not faction oriented every single week and will also throw in challenges that are faction oriented. The Japanese version now only has challenges that are faction oriented. Hope that makes sense. So next we have is Expedition Mode. Expedition Mode allows you to once a day go into a campaign where you can play a set of missions that cost absolutely no stamina and you get medals for partaking in it. But there is one catch. If a pilot dies during any of the missions, you can no longer use that pilot and the Nightmare Frame for the rest of that campaign. After you complete a campaign going forward, you can actually simulate it once a day. Or a better way to put it is once a day you can either start a campaign in expedition mode or if you've already completed a campaign you can just simply skip through it collect the items and move on now one big difference between the Japanese and the global version is how this is handled so in the global version when you challenge a campaign and you decide to leave in the middle basically you don't finish it when you re-enter expedition mode it will take you right back to that map that shows you all the missions in the global version it'll take you back to the main screen and instead you will see the current campaign you started with a little thing in the corner that tells you how many missions you've completed of the current ones for that campaign. The reason why this is important, let's say on the first day you complete the normal campaign and on day two you start to do the hard campaign. You don't finish it. So then day three comes and you want to skip through the normal campaign to collect all the items without having to replay it. Well, the problem is when you enter expedition mode, you will still start out in the hard missions. You'll see the campaign of all the levels you have to complete. If you want to simulate normal, then you have to essentially give up on the current one you're in to go back to the main menu to then skip through normal. Then you're going to have to restart hard and for wherever you left, let's say you were like, let's say five or seven, you'll have to start again from the beginning. So what the Japanese version did is that no matter what the situation is, when you enter expedition mode, you'll always see the main screen and they save your progress per campaign. The global version does not do that. So keep that in mind when you're assigned to go through a campaign. It's kind of annoying, but you have to finish it at one time or you're going to have to give it up to skip through another one, which is really frustrating. And I hope that update comes sooner or later in the global version. Next, we have a special event. This one happens to be called the Suppression Event. It's actually just started. It's only in the Japanese version. The way this works is you go from the start position and essentially you just pick different missions to complete. And the catch here is that once you've completed a mission, you can no longer use that pilot for any future missions. So one of the strategies here is to use the weaker pilots to complete the easier missions and save your better pilots for the harder missions. And as you do this, you get certain awards like these red flags for the Black Knights that you can use to buy stuff at the store or generic lockets for rank 4 pilots which we discussed earlier are really hard to acquire and they're really useful so you can see the value behind this event all I will say if you're starting out in the game you may not want to do these type of things because it requires you to have a lot of pilots because you'll have to use a bunch of teams to complete it so it's not really good for beginners to an extent it's, it's more for intermediate or advanced players and when I say advanced or intermediate I'm not 
not saying like skill level i just mean like you've been playing the game for half a year to a year so that's how that works oh and one more thing you can also reset too so let's say hypothetically you went to the first mission you picked a character you really like and you realize after completing the mission that you used a character that was too powerful so you kind of wasted them you can actually skip that mission and you can try it again or hypothetically later on down the road you could actually just restart the whole thing and go from beginning to wherever you were the problem with that though is obviously you had to pay stamina to play these missions you have to redo that part again and you won't get flags as an award if you complete a mission you already finished before so you can't like take advantage of this system you can take advantage of the reset to complete all the paths which i can discuss in a future video but that's how the suppression works Next you have our events. Events are a combination of everything we've kind of discussed at this point. So events have a story component, they have a battle component, and they have an expedition component. And you have to complete it in that order. So first you do the battles, which unlock the story, just like in main story. When you complete those missions, then there are expedition levels specifically for that event that go from easy to extra. As you complete these easy to extra expedition campaigns, you get a specific resource you can then use in the store to buy stuff events also have their own exclusive characters and their own exclusive shop like i just mentioned in the global version they did several different takes on the events i don't know in the one we're getting if we're going to have the older versions or they're going to just go right to what we have now but there's different variants they had of the events early on and they kept changing it because japanese players were complaining so i just mentioned is the current format going on right now in the game so that's everything for the quest menu let's now go back to the home page so what you see here, this is the login screen every single time you log into the game. By the way, you realize exactly when I was recording this because this is right before the daily login. And during daily login, you'll get stuff like things associated with the current event. You might also get things like here's another event going on for the musicals. I got another skip ticket or I'm sorry, a Black Knight summon ticket. Then you also get items in general. Here's a uh, pizza. And then we get back to the home screen. All right, so now let's talk about guilds because guilds are kind of important. Once you've unlocked a guild by completing enough of the quest main story missions, you have access to either join a guild or start your own. When you join a guild, you get lots of cool things like Black Knight Gold. Also, your guild master, in this case, this is my guild, you can do different things to help the players in the guild. Of all the things here you can do, this is the best one because it gives you a stamina boost. And obviously more stamina means you can complete more missions during a day. Additionally, you you can view who's in the guild you can also view items if you're a guild master obviously if you're not then you can't do that and here is where you can get certain amount of currency used to buy stuff in the guild by completing missions and then there's also this option here where you can request items so essentially if you are low on items like i'll just do one for for the sake of this tutorial let's say i want more strategy type pieces that are bronze i can hit this button and now people on the guild can give me some or if you're doing this you can request yourself for items and hopefully people give it to you and you get an incentive for doing so because if you do give people items then you gain black knight coins which are very important now every single day you need to do one of these sticker things because it gives you a boost to your stamina that's why you do it plus you get guild medals which are listed here you can also text anytime you want to like i could say hello guys how's it hanging and then you can post it right there and so everyone can take a look and respond to it or you can ask questions then we also have these exclusive guild events in this case the nightmare frame boss battle so let's go into that now this one's currently completed but the way it works is there's a nightmare frame boss that you have to defeat there are currently five stages you can complete each one gets harder than the next and as you defeat the boss you get a certain score and that score determines exactly what items you'll get when the event is over it used to be 10 missions but they've turned into five which i appreciate because it's less work for you to do and less stamina you have to pay every single time but because only five missions it is progressively harder to complete complete now you can get different awards in these boss events so first you have these items you have summit tickets a nightmare frame and nightmare frame upgrade item that's what you get for one part of the score that you obtain next you have are the guild medals that you get through your total score so as you're playing more and more it's the accumulative total of everything you've got and then you have like most you got in one time which is this so the higher score you get per a particular mission the more stuff you get this is why they added kaguya to the game recently because she increased the damage you can inflict and also these nightmare frame boss battles have an extra stage which gets you even higher 
your scores, which gets you even more items. But for most people, you can complete the first five stages or however many there are in your current version of the game, and you should be able to get most of the items. The key part about the Nightmare Frame boss battle is everyone in the guild has to partake in it, or at least enough people. As long as you complete all the five stages and get a high enough score, you should get all the items. So that's how that works. It's a really cool collaborative thing you can do, and that's why the guild is very important. Okay, let's go into arena mode, because why not? So arena mode is the player versus player battle system in the game, and there are two components to it. Before we get into those components, you'll notice right away that I got this little pop-up screen. What this indicates is that some player tried to defeat my map and they suffered losses. And so if that happens, you get medals because the entire point of this game is to build a team to fight off against defending attackers. So I hit the button here to show my current deployment, I believe. So this is it. There are two components, like I said. The first component is you need to create a formation to intercept attacking teams. So I placed all my nightmare frames in a certain location, and this is based on healers and cloakers and all that crappy stuff. That's completely unfair to attacking teams. The other element to this is the attacking part. So what's interesting about this mode is that normally, when you play this game and you place a nightmare frame on the battlefield, they don't move, right? They stand still because they're trying to defend an area. But in this mode, you're actually attacking. So your nightmare frames actually do move. Well, the ones that are on the ground. The ranged ones do not move, but the melee ones do. And so that adds a whole new element to the game because now every nightmare frame pilot has an action type. If you remember earlier, I was talking about like the action type for a pilot, and this is where it comes into play. Different types of pilots based on their classification will do different things. Some don't move. Some move away from enemies, some move towards enemies. It just depends what they are. And it's important to check out that information on their particular page on the pilot enhanced section. Now to be transparent, I don't usually worry about that too much. I tend to use more ranged weapons or when I do use melee nightmare frames, I have it laid out where it doesn't really matter what their behaviors are. I can complete the challenges anyways, but still it's important to know what pilots do or don't do when they are deployed in arena mode. And so in arena mode, your goal is essentially to take out the enemy's defensive formation and the way you do this is by taking out these towers you see. Each time you destroy a tower, it unlocks a new area where you can deploy your nightmare frames. So when the game first starts, you can only deploy nightmare frames within a certain section like this. Once you take out a tower, then you can deploy your nightmare frames in this section. When you take out this tower, you can deploy your nightmare frames in this section. And when you take out this tower, you can deploy your nightmare frames in this section. That's very important. Now recently they added a thing where if any pilots are in a particular section that you destroy the tower of, they are also wiped out. That's the whole dynamics of this you put together a team to defend the area and then you challenge other people's placements you can only do arena mode three times a day currently in the Japanese version only you can use certain nightmare frames to increase your score after you complete a particular challenge you will actually get a score I'm not entirely sure how this works but from my experience the score seems to be based on how fast you complete it how many nightmare frames you take out and the total damage you deal but again I'm not entirely sure that seems to be the factor there sometimes I defeat really easy challenges and I get high scores or I beat really hard challenges and I get low scores so I don't know speaking of that when you want to challenge arena mode you can pick a particular pilot you want to go against now a couple things to note this is their rank i'm 55 and i'm playing it without spending money so if you see 63 65 these are people who are definitely whales additionally you can see their battle scores if they're really high this is probably gonna be a really good team now if you don't like what you see only one time you can mulligan and it'll give you more options only one time though and it only happens for the first round if you complete the first round let's say you pick this person you want to go against them and then after completing it you no longer have the mulligan option so keep that in mind now before you hit the red button to go against them you want to hit this button instead this button will show you their formation so give it a second for it to load or i don't know several seconds i guess so it shows you their formation it's very important to see what your opponent has placed on the battlefield before you attack it because you never know there could be really annoying things like cloakers healers whatever this formation tends to be pretty easy to take out because there's no annoying nightmare frame pilots with annoying abilities but it's very important you take a look at this before you actually partake in the battle another really important thing about arena mode which is extremely frustrating 
but if you are in the middle of a battle and for whatever reason you click out you lose connection whatever the case may be that's it you cannot replay it again you get three tries only so in the first try if it fails that's it it's over you'll be sent to the screen you were before you have to rechallenge that same map again it's really frustrating so when you're doing arena mode you gotta be very careful that you don't do anything stupid to accidentally click out of the mission because you don't get a mulligan you can't restart it if you screw up that's it another thing to note in arena mode just like expedition if your pilot dies that's it they're gone for the rest of that particular battle not for the rest of arena mode but just for that battle they're taken out and you can never use them again so keep that in mind as well don't just place pilots willy-nilly because if they do die you can't use them for the rest of the battle these parts of arena mode are kind of frustrating and i i in my own experience other people have said it well in my guild that they've been they've had connection issues and then they're kind of fudged because well i had three battles and the first one got disconnected so i only have two now and that sucks because if you want to keep your league rank then you have to make sure that you get a certain amount of weekly points that's how arena mode works oh one more thing you need a higher rank to buy certain items in the arena mode shop you can go to that by clicking this and during the mode you saw i got like these red medals that's the arena mode medals and every week you get more arena mode medals as you maintain your current rank or you climb higher in rank so that's how arena mode essentially works let's go back to the home screen okay so we've gone through everything down here we've gone through everything up here let's return out to this little section here first with training mode so i've referenced training mode enough times now let's explain how it works so if you want to level up your pilots like i mentioned you can use those items you can also increase it during a battle itself but also through training mode which levels up your pilots there's a weird paradox with this mode so early on in the game you're only gonna have one room activated i have three because i'm playing this game forever but only one when you first start you gotta reach rank 21 i believe to get two rooms and then rank 50 or 45 to get three but the problem is if you reach that high of a rank then you probably already level up the characters to get there so the training mode becomes basically pointless as a result the only reason why i still use training mode right now is because sometimes i'm too lazy to spend my xp or because you generate xp items so what you see here is after a period of time i selected to do training mode in this case i think i did 12 hours and what's nice is you hit this button here and it will go through all of them so when you go through the room it gives you like how well you did a character might level up and you get items xpms down here and then you go through all the rooms and you can train if pilots are already leveled up because again you want the xp items you can also go to a particular room like this and you can hit this button and pick how many hours you want generally i do 12 because i'm not really in a rush to level up my pilots but let's say you are you could do one hour now here's the thing 12 hours is better because you get more items and the level up process is usually more efficient you get a better rating like greater perfect another thing to note is you have these things called training room skip tickets so we have the skip tickets for missions you also have skip tickets for the training room and so the way it works basically is let's say you want to do this one right here let's say we do 12 hours we say yes sure you gotta wait 12 hours for us to finish or you get a skip ticket the skip tickets are useful if you want to quickly level up a pilot and you don't want to use your other xp items but you have to accumulate those throughout the game you can also level up these things here which simply make whatever you're picking level up faster so this is rank four pilots annihilators healers defense whatever that's how that works another thing if you don't want to actually select your team this button right here allows you to actually just pick the same team and pick the amount of hours you want. If you are selecting a pilot, you can do it here. There's a certain option you might find helpful. I don't think it's in the global version, but it's in Japanese. This thing called level max, it'll show you every pilot that's not maxed out. Now, I just got Toto to level 60, so you won't see any pilots here, but when you first start, you'll see plenty. It's another way to like sort out which ones you actually should level up just because they're not maxed out yet. But generally speaking, at some point in the game, this mode will be kind of pointless, except for getting you XP items so that's kind of unfortunate i generally don't even rank up anything i just don't find that useful but maybe you will i don't know that's just how i play this game all right let's go home again all right this hamburger bun unlocks other options we can go on so i'll just click these real quick here is the help mode pretty basic anything in the game you can look up how it works obviously i can't read japanese but for the global version it'll be in english which is nice then back to the hamburger bun we didn't have slang code configuration you can control different things like the sound uh, other options if you want to do account transfers although for some reason i don't think you can do this with the global version at least for the korean and the chinese version i didn't see any option to do any account transferring i hope to god you can do that with the global release because being able to go from one mobile device to another is, is extremely helpful and if they don't allow that that's gonna be kind of a bummer okay back to the hamburger bun 
Then we have something called Costume. This is only available to the Japanese version, but basically any pilot you have, you can give them a different costume to change their appearance when you use them either in the main screen or when you use them in battle. So for example, Dorothea, I think I have one of her costumes, I don't know. Yeah, I do. So I have the swimsuit that I have bought. You can of course not have that and she'll look like this. Give her the swimsuit and she'll have that at all times. The same applies to Colin. So for Colin, I took her swimsuit outfit, which is this one right here, and I gave her this one instead. So if I use this Colin in combat, she'll look like this when you see her special or on the home screen, which I'll show you in a minute. Next we have is the BGM. Now this allows you to change the, the sounds for parts of the game to ones you can purchase in the store with your own money by the way. In the Korean and Chinese version of this game, they don't let you buy any other songs. So you basically are stuck with just Pendulum and eventually Lost. You can't use any other songs in the game. I hope that the global release does not have this problem, but in the other ones I've used, you can't do that. So I'm not sure if it's just a Chinese and Korean thing, or if this is something that all global versions of Lost Stories are gonna have. Because right now, you can only buy these songs for the Japanese version and nothing else, which really sucks. Okay, moving on, we have Archive. Archive is a mode, as the name suggests, where you can view everything in the game. So starting with Story, you can view all the different stories you've played through so far. Now, one thing you should note, you will not see this in the global version. Instead, what you'll see is this. It's called Expedition. Because right now in the Japanese version, we actually have additional things to watch besides Expedition. So what you see here is the first intro, which you can watch here. This is the ending to R1 and the second intro. Here is the Expedition mode, and here Here's the birthday ones as well. But again, in your case, you'll just see expedition mode. Another story lets you view all the stories of any character you've gone through. And that's something really important. If you have not gone through a particular story of a character or event or anything, you cannot play it in this mode, which is such a bummer because in the case of events, which are limited by the way, if you do not go through them, you cannot replay them ever again. At least Janissary Code allowed you to pay some Sakuradite to view them. Lost story doesn't do that. Maybe in the future they will, but unless you play through the event story, you cannot replay it again. And what's really frustrating about the global version is that it's currently behind the Chinese and the Korean one and has missed several events. So I have no idea how they're going to reconcile that problem. Maybe they'll give us the events on the first day it comes out, but it's really confusing because the timing is really off. We've already missed, if I'm not mistaken, the Knights of the Round event, the Swimsuit event, the Butler event, and I'm sure there's other ones as well. So they definitely need to fix that going forward because people want to go through those events on the of course the global version i mean heck i want to because i want to see what actually happened i'm not a big fan of translating every single screenshot to see what's going on and so i hope that they actually figure a way to give us those stories translated even though we've already passed the events which is not really our fault it's the developer's fault anyway short rant over that's how this works for this part of archive mode let's go back a couple uh, pages here then we have the characters you can view any character you want this tells you how many pilots and are in the game not like variants of the pilots but just like unique individuals so there's 57 different characters in the game who have their own amount of pilots so all the 57 characters i have 50 which is actually not too bad honestly you can go to any character you want let's say c2 for example and a couple things you can do is one you can zoom in on their little screen the artwork here you can see the scout which is the animation when you summon them like this which is kind of cool. Here is their factions. They're, she's part of the Ashford and the Black Knights. Although it's kind of weird because she's never available for Ashford missions, but apparently she's part of Ashford. Here you have information about the pilot in case of C2. We don't know much. Here's a little thing about a profile. Here you can change the costume from the other pilots you've unlocked. So I can put this one on instead. Now, if you go to this part here, you can hear different sound bites. You want to play them. I have currently the game muted, but you could, you could hear it obviously. So that's a speech. If you want to actually watch the video of the character, you can flip this here and you can see different different uh, videos of them. So this one is for the intimacy. So if you unlock different intimacy in the game, you'll get this really nice animation where they talk like this. And then it'll, you'll see a little thing in the bottom here that goes like, you reach rank, whatever, like rank two, right? You also have one for when they're first summoned, which is this one here. That's when you first get her. And then you also have the birthday version. So if I hit this button here, this is what she says to you on your birthday for your character. And because she doesn't have a birthday in the story, you don't have one for her. But if I was to go out to, let's say, uh, let's go to like Cecile or something. And then because she actually has a birthday, which is listed here, you can go to this part and flip this to the video. And so you have your birthday and then her birthday, I believe. 
if I'm not mistaken. It's what I, I don't know exact which order is which, but one that's for your birthday and one is for her birthday. And again, you can switch your costumes. You can hear different sound bites from the character. So it's kind of cool. It's definitely a fun way to go through the character. And I like how they give you information about them, which is really important. I mean, not important, but you know, it's nice to have. By the way, Cecile's birthday is coming up next month. So they're giving a special character for her. I'm looking forward to that. After you've gone through the archive of the characters, you have the nightmare frames. So let's go through an individual one here. Here is the Lancelot. You can pick the different weapons. What's really nice too is if you haven't unlocked all the weapons, as long as you have the nightmare frame, you could technically view all the weapons. Here's another weapon. This is the uh, the shield, the master vibration, uh, sorry, the Varus cannon and then master vibration swords. Give you some stats about the nightmare frame. You can move them around. You can view the skill for that weapon, which is really cool. So if you, so even though I have the animations turned off, you can still view them over here. Here, which is awesome you can also view the scout it's so like when they're deployed to the battlefield what you see generally and you'll see this animation by the way when the nightmare frame bosses attack you in this form right here so that is archive mode essentially it just lets you view all different stuff you've already experienced and it's a nice little put together packet okay after that let's talk about item so at this point in the game, we've gone over how to upgrade pilots, how to upgrade nightmare frames, how the battle mechanics work, all the different things you can do during the game, and the awards you get, or items you need to accomplish these things. This is a place where you can view basically everything you have. So in this first section here, you can view your arena medals, your guild medals, which is actually over here. These are your expedition medals, so sorry. Arena mode medals, expedition medals, and then guild medals. The stone you need to sell for generic lockets, which we'll get to in a moment. Uh, the pizza for your stamina the black knight tickets the rainbow tickets level skip tickets training skip tickets and boosters for your daily missions these are items that improve training mode that's that next we have our items for boosting characters so the xp items we have the different lockets you need the generic ones to limit break your pilots more items for upgrading pilots then we have items for the different types so assault defense healers annihilators strategy type special and so forth and even more things we also have these other items that improve the stats of the pilot here is the list of all the duplicate character lockets as i mentioned before when you summon the same pilot you'll get a set of these lockets now there's two ways you can handle this the first way is you can actually just sell them one at a time like this which is kind of pointless because you generally want to sell them all but you at least can do one at a time which is nice but generally i don't do that what i rather do is actually go down to this bottom section here right here which has all the lockets you have now the thing is when you have a pilot that goes to level 99 you no longer need the lockets anymore because you've already limit break them to the max so what you can do is you can sell those off and what's nice is the game tells you if you max them out by giving you this red label on them in the japanese version only you hit this one button right here and sell all of them for stone in the global version you'll have to sell them individually and there's basically no benefit to keeping these not sold because they don't do anything for you so i'm going to buy them all right now and i'm going to sell all them for the stone the stone allows you to purchase generic lockets to limit break whatever rank you prefer we'll get to that in just a second now the nightmare frames work a little differently but the same basic concept if you remember earlier i mentioned that if you want to upgrade a nightmare frame you have to use a nightmare frame upgrade cube to get that cube you have to sell your duplicate nightmare frame cubes you can either sell them all at once or one at a time i recommend one at a time just in case you need to produce a nightmare frame for whatever reason now eventually you'll get so many extras you don't care anymore but early on you might want to save them for you know just in case now the way it works is you just simply go up this meter and you can sell as many as you want and that will give you the certain amount of cube i believe it's one to one so one duplicate nightmare frame cube gets you one upgrade cube the rest of these just tell you other items you have like i've said before so the only reason why you'll ever come here is just to manage your pilot duplicate lockets or your duplicate nightmare frame cube otherwise you won't be in this mode that much Next, let's talk about missions. So in this game, there are many types of missions that give you many type of awards. For example, we have the beginner mission. When you first start playing this game, there'll be a series of awards you get that are exclusive to this beginner mission banner, including a rainbow ticket, lots of Sakuradite, pilot, things like that. Daily missions are things you get for doing daily tasks. I have already two right here. Here's that little boost I mentioned before for the daily task quest missions. And then here is for the guild 
guild medals because I actually post that image in the guild. Here's weekly missions that you accomplish during the week. And then you have total missions which are based on completing these very large milestones. You also have expedition missions which will give you awards by completing certain expedition levels. So here you have for the easy, the normal, the hard. And then the extra, which I've not done yet because they're really hard. Then you also have something called event missions, where after completing certain missions in an event, you also get awards. And chapter missions, where if you complete enough chapter missions, both the normal battle and the extra, you also get awards. So that's another thing as well. The next thing to talk about is the shop. The shop is a place where you get to buy stuff. And you buy stuff using all the resources we talked about so far in this game. So the very first shop we have is the event shop. Event is where you can buy items exclusive to the shop for a limited amount of time. And the resource you use to pay for these items is whatever the event is giving you. So in this case, we're getting these Black Knight flags. In the last event for the summer, it was like some specific Gios item. I believe they fell on the beach. Whatever it is, during an event, you'll get a specific resource you can use to purchase stuff in the resource-specific shop. Next, we have the once-a-month shop, which allows you to buy specific items using your Sakura Dite. So here you can buy this upgrade for Nightmare Frames and Black Knight Coins. This is training mode skip tickets and level up items. Early on in the game, it's worth paying for these items. Later on, not so much. Next, we have the Nightmare Frame shop, which I talked about earlier. In this mode, you can buy any Nightmare Frame. However, you have to use paid Sakura Dite. If you notice, I have no paid Sakura Dite, but you would need paid Sakura Dite. Anytime you want, you can view the stats of any Nightmare Frame before you purchase it, which I do like. So often, even when I don't actually want to buy anything, which is 9% of the time, actually it's 100% of the time, I can still view the stats of the Nightmare Frame if I'm just curious what it looks like when it's fully maxed out. There are some Nightmare Frames you cannot get in the store. For example, the... What is it? The Serlin Purist version is not available. I don't think the Percival is either. Is it? I don't know. I could be wrong. Yeah, I only get the Percival. Oh, there it is. Never mind. You can't get the Percival. Okay, so the Serlin Purist version you cannot get in the store for some reason. And there are some Nightmare Frames like the Zero Kagori, which was an exclusive Nightmare Frame for the first year anniversary, you cannot get in the store. Next is the BGM. And in the global version for the Chinese and Korean version, it's not available, so there's no point discussing it for that version, but for the Japanese, you can buy any of these songs and use them in that BGM menu, which I mentioned earlier. Next we have is the generic locket shop, where you spend the stone we just acquired from selling those duplicate character lockets. For the level one, it's pretty cheap because level one characters are not that great, or rank one rather. Rank two ones aren't too bad, rank three aren't so bad, but rank four are very expensive because rank fours are the best in the game. And for most rank fours, unless you're whaling, you're gonna have to buy these generic lockets. So in my case, I'll select here, I'll go max. I bought 15 for my 1000, that's kind of rough. You'll have to summon a lot to get a lot of duplicates so you can buy more of these generic lockets. Then we have the first shop for the arena mode. This is for the costumes. Again, only available in the Japanese version at this time. But here, you can buy any costume and then you go into the costume menu if you want to switch a character with the one you purchased. It has no actual impact on gameplay. It's all cosmetic. Here's the actual shop for arena mode that lets you use your arena mode medals to buy stuff. This shop, by the way, it refills every single week. So if you buy everything next week, you'll have access to the same items again. The cool part about this store is you can buy Nightmare Frame upgrade cubes, Nightmare Frame upgrade eggs, and stuff like that. But you have to have a rank, I believe it's like rank A in arena mode to actually get this stuff. That's why you want to play arena mode and get a higher rank so you can buy some of this stuff. Next we have is the medals for the expedition mode. This also refills once a week and you have these specific deals like this where it's five of these guns is only 25, but if you go down here, one costs 10. So obviously this is a better deal, but it's limited. And these are also kind of expensive. I only have 819 medals, so I don't usually go here too often unless I'm really strapped for items. So keep that in mind. Like you can easy run out of medals very quickly in this store. Next we have is the guild store where you buy stuff with guild medals this will replenish every month be aware of that you can buy these nightmare frame upgrade items you can get gold sometimes they have nightmare frames like this one the magdola and other items as well to purchase but again it's only once a month it refills keep in mind when you're playing through the game do not forget to buy stuff if you need to specifically this one i always forget and also the lockets are super important okay let's go back to the home page 
a couple more things to go over. First of all, hit this button here and you can go in the chat. Hit this button here and you can see the current thing is going on right now. If you hit this button, you can go through awards you get. So essentially in the game, when you buy an item, you have it right away. But sometimes the game will give you awards. To collect the awards, you simply go through here and it gives it to you. Next thing we have is this functionality. Hit this button here and it will give you a zoom out of the character and the nightmare frames. If you hit this button, it'll show you the alternative art of the character. In the Japanese version, hit this button here and you get a zoomed out of the character, which is really cool. Hit this button here and you can view all the nightmare frames that you currently have that you decided to place. And if you hit this button here, it'll just do, it'll get rid of the icons. I'm not gonna do that, but that's how that works. So let's zoom out. Or not, it'll just go out, go out one more time. If you wanna change this, you can hit this button here to do that. So first thing, we can choose a different pilot. So for Colin, if you remember, I changed one of her outfits to the one which is wearing the shirt which is the swimsuit one. I don't know why I did that. So go to the swimsuit one and see how she's wearing the shirt now. So I hit enter. This is what she'll look like in my main screen. Here, you can pick which nightmare frames you wanna show up. I'm not gonna change this, but anyone you select will be present on the main screen. And then here you can choose the background. As you complete missions, both for events and just the regular story chapters, you'll get different backgrounds. Like this is the Karuga. This is the first base that Black Knights have. This is the G1 base. This is what you get after defeating, uh, completing R1. Obviously Obviously in the global version, we're not there yet. This is from when Zaku became the Knight of Seven, obviously not there yet. The first swimsuit event, the first Halloween event, the first Christmas event, the first New Year's event, Valentine's, the men event for Ashford. This is Spain, I believe, when we get Mary Bell. This is the Brides event and the last summer event. So you just pick whatever you want. Uh, we'll pick the summer one, because you know, why not? And there we go, now we're by the beach. Then let me zoom out or go back to the main menu. And there you go, now she's by the beach. If I hit this here, she's right by all the nightmare frame. If I uh, hit this button here, you see what she actually looks like without the costume, which is that swimsuit. So that's everything about Code Gas Lost Stories. This was a massive guide. And I hope it all made sense to you. If you have any additional questions, please let me know in the comment section below. I hope you enjoyed this video and I'll see you guys in the Code Gas Global Release. Take care.